Hi guys, good evening. Uh, good evening to all and welcome you all in this SC100 certification webinar. Uh, participants are requested to note that we'll start the webinar in 5 to 10 minutes as participants are still joining the webinar. I repeat, we'll start the webinar in 5 to 10 minutes as participants are still joining the webinar. Thank you. Guys, we are yet to start the webinar. Please note, we'll wait for more five minutes as participants are still joining us. I repeat, those who have connected just not just now, please note that we'll start the webinar in five minutes as per more participants are joining us. So we'll wait for them, then we'll start the webinar. Thank you.
okay so we are good to start now uh, good evening to one and all uh, we welcome you all in this webinar on sc100 microsoft cyber security architect uh, myself shaitali your host for this webinar i'll be there to help you out throughout the session also participants are requested to use the chat box to ask the questions or queries related to the topic moving ahead uh, talking about our webinar sponsor synergetics so synergetics is india's one of a kind corporate learning solution company so which uh, provides certification training as well as trainings on solutions like onboarding solution then we have reskilling solution certification solution certification plus add on solution cloud adoption solution architecting solution practice playbook solution latest technology training solution and emerging technology training solution then today's webinar is organized and handled by atc community that is azure tech community and sponsored by synergetics and microsoft so our atc community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technologies so users need to follow the meetup groups which are an emerging technology community for all then we have pune community for pune kers then the community specifically made for techies in surat which is emerging technology community surat then we have azure tech community nagpur for nagpur kers uh you just have to install the meetup app on your phone or on your device and follow our communities so you will get the relevant updates about the webinars which we conduct then we have a small code of conduct please note no one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen recording while speaker is sharing his screen also this recording will be uploaded on our official youtube channel so you can get the access over there i will share the youtube channel link with you all in the chat box later speaker for this webinar mr om prakash pandey he is an mct microsoft certified trainer and currently works with synergetics as avp of delivery department he has years of experience in delivering the certification training moving ahead the agenda for this webinar so participants will get an overview of the certification and the benefit related to it also we will share learning learning achievement badge for sc100 so the steps will be mentioned with the url in the chat box for you all please note this is the complimentary badge so you just have to follow these steps to get your badge activated once get activated you can view all the modules also to get the updates regarding the workshop webinar we do also it's a request to all the participants to make sure you submit the feedback form by the end of the session the feedback form link will be shared with you all in the chat box by the end of the session Uh, uh, that's all from my side over to you op sir thank you thanks to all thank you chaitali thank you very much for the great introduction hello and welcome everyone i hope i am audible to you all Just give me a moment. Let me share my screen. Do let me know once my screen is visible to you all. Can you all see my screen? Thank you.
as shaitali rightly mentioned my name is om prakash pande i have been part of trading industry from last 20 odd years i am azure certified sharepoint architect i am also a security consultant though these certification papers have been released pretty recently but from a security standpoint especially cyber security or various solutions security solutions like microsoft intune endpoint security solutions microsoft sentinel microsoft purview the some of these technologies have been there in bits and pieces or some part of these solutions have been existing for pretty long time many of us would have already used some of these solutions i am confident everybody here in this classroom or at people attended this attending this session they would definitely be aware about microsoft intune they may have used it they may have worked with it or they may be part of the end user section who have been seeing that some of these tasks and activities they were not able to perform because of the policies being enforced so i'm pretty much aware on that and i'm confident as we go ahead we will realize that these security solutions have already been there in place some of the messages or restrictions enforced on us were because of these security solutions as part of the entire details if you look at the series of security solutions that we have right there is a complete set available here and what microsoft has done is they have mapped relevant certification papers with each of these resources which i'm going to talk about as i go ahead everyone who has joined this session i am confident that they are aware about the significance of certification why should people go ahead get themselves certified if not just i'll spend a minute or two on uh, briefing importance of certification guys once it comes to today's world especially when you're looking at jobs or when you're getting on to a newer projects whenever you are getting new opportunities in all these scenarios what is a common aspect today everybody is asking for everyone is asking for newer solutions everybody is asking for certified resources right and to make sure we are able to get these opportunities sorry making sure we are able to get these opportunities we need to be certified before the opportunity knocks our door and that's the reason why i think most of people have joined here thank you very much for it as part of synergetics we have identified need of certifications and emerging technologies in a very initial days itself we want to make sure that everybody who aligned to emerging technologies wants to learn something new they are part of our emerging technology sessions we work with them we are able we should be able to help them in achieving their dreams goals objectives and that's why we keep doing these sessions so anybody who wants to ensure they have a smooth career going ahead you all can enroll in our programs as well like chaitali mentioned and she will be putting some of the links on the chat window as well now one would say there are so many resources that we have given by microsoft so why would somebody needs to attend a ilt based session so i would say that once it comes to online resources 
online resources are really really helpful but at the same time having an end to end experience and especially at synergetics where we have our consult we, we have our team members who have been part of various consulting projects as well they have real world experience and that's what differentiates us from other vendors in the market today now what it comes to certification exam there are number of online courses for it as well number of dumps which are also available but once you have cleared the certification and you join an organization they would expect you to deliver on live projects and that's where the next half of your implementation knowledge will come into play so that's the reason why i would recommend that you should attend a course as well after going through all the online program and having relevant badges for it keeping this context in mind let's proceed ahead shaitali has already briefed you about me so i don't want to repeat that now before i proceed ahead with the session can i see quick raise of hand people who are from security background who have worked with security solutions in past can i see a raise of hand okay nilesh nanda kumar i'm seeing two of them right now how about others okay i can see mark as well that's it okay i can see few more one more hand being raised okay not a problem thank you very much guys put your hands down let's proceed ahead thanks nilesh so i can see few hands being raised people who have already worked with security solutions now before i proceed ahead let me quickly brief you about some of the courses available and how will it make sense so guys if you look at some of the security solutions and relevant certifications sc 900 is something which is where we can begin with right as part of sc 900 this is security fundamentals now as part of sc 900 it briefs about number of services which includes azure active directory which includes resources like defender microsoft defender apart from this information rights management right so some of the key features you all will see as part of sc 900 the next key resource that you will see as part of the arb solutions would be sc 200 sc 200 is more to do with security solutions using microsoft defender so various aspects over here in terms of microsoft sentinel kql queries and especially working with security center within microsoft and also some of the key resources within azure platform so all these things gets covered as part of sc200 the next important resource that we have over here is sc300 which is creation of security solutions and the focus area over here is azure active directory so all premium features and things which is spanning across microsoft 365 environment and also azure everything gets covered under azure active directory now there will be some overlap over here between az500 or uh, uh, az500 or az204 right because there are also some of the aspects of 
Azure Active Directory gets covered, right? So you'll see some overlap over here with other papers. Next resource that we have, or next certification that you have over here is SC400. SC400 is more in terms of another set of security solution, which is mapped with information rights management. Okay, and here it talks about another key member, which is compliance.microsoft.com, whereas uh, SC200 is more to do with security.microsoft.com. SC400 is about taxonomy, labeling of various information, how do you classify and categorize different set of details, right? So this is, these are three ARB based solutions that we have, which will help you specialize in these areas. Now, I would recommend you may or may not do SC900. That's an optional paper, but you'll need to do one of these papers, SC200, SC300, SC400, you all need to do one of these papers before you all go ahead with SC100. SC100 is the last paper, I would say, in, in, in terms of sequence. The, the number is at, at a lowest, lowest rank, but if you see the sequence of how these papers have been released, SC100 came much later, right? Before that, before that we already have just give me a moment. Sorry, guys. So if you look at the sequence of papers over here, SC 900, SC 200, 300, 400, and finally came SC100, which is Cybersecurity Architect. So once it comes to SC100, it is assumed, or I would generally go for go with an assumption that you'll have already done some of these papers. If not, my request would be after today's session, please go through some of these solutions, some of these pre-existing papers, right? Get yourself certified. I would request Chaitali to share some of the older links. I have already uh, done some of the sessions on SC400, SC300, right? So she can share that YouTube links with y'all. So y'all can go through it. Give those certifications before y'all appear for SC100, right? So this would be the sequence of certification papers that you have over here. I'm sure this makes sense for you all. So keeping this context in mind, let's proceed ahead. So why have I given this brief? The reason why I have given this brief is when you look at this architecting course, some of these points that I have mentioned you'll find being referred over here or being mentioned over here, right? Which will make sense if you have done these papers earlier. So if you look at this course, this is more to do with designing security solutions by understanding and looking what are the new attacks or what are the new challenges that organizations are facing today, especially once it comes to security. Now, once it comes to roles and responsibilities of a cybersecurity architect, this guy is the one who's doing a thankless job. <laughs> so only when there's an attack, people would know significance of cybersecurity architect. Otherwise, by the time everything is running smooth, every um, request that is being sent, you are being asked to mention the data correctly, mention your credentials correctly. You have been asked to, uh, uh, some of the outgoing emails have been blogged. So you will realize that this is part of an 
enterprise security process right but once things go for a toss then you will realize boss certain things certain ports have been left open certain security measures have not been applied that should have been done and then people start looking for who was the architect or what is the implementation team doing and how was how was this uh, security attack was even possible after putting in so much effort right but yes once it comes to architecting for security this will be the foundation that one needs to build as an enterprise and especially when you have a lot of important customer data owned by your organization right so we have to be very 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 careful when we are working with security we have to understand the expectations requirements by the uh, relevant team member if you are a security consultant you'll have to make sure you understand the customers requirement pretty well understand their expectations what do they want and what would be your step by step approach to implement as security right so if you look at some of the prerequisites that is talking about identity and access management this is what it is talking about is sc 300 second thing that you will see is platform protection security operations securing data uh, in sorry platform protection security operations this is part of microsoft defender microsoft defender solutions security operations microsoft sentinel gives you steam and soar implementation options right event and uh, incidents and event management and what would you, what would be your automated response mechanism over here that would be part of your security operations as part of securing data and securing applications most of this details securing applications you'll again find as part of cloud security options which is again part of sc uh, 200 but for securing data and securing securing applications with network security virtual machine security these are part of your az 500 that's that's which is a uh, dedicated paper towards azure platform and how various things can be various uh, resources can be secured over here along with this if you look at the next point experience with hybrid and cloud implementation as far as hybrid security is concerned microsoft does have lot of resources here as part of system center as part of um, hypervisor or on premises security solutions so we can go through that but there is no specific certification paper which is mentioned over here keeping that context in mind if you look at the details over here if you look at the details over here you'll find lot of stuff just give me a moment yeah i don't know why it's asking for user id and password i have already logged in earlier let's proceed ahead so if you go to your certification course over here you'll find latest modules and what are the microsoft learn modules that you have which is mapped to this paper you can get that information it provides a very uh, to say top level and good explanation about why this paper what are the fundamental aspects that a cyber security architect needs to take care so all that details you will find over here if you look at the key modules as part of the certification paper this is really really interesting module number 1 is starting with zero trust right now if you look at any organization implementation right most of the cases based on my experience i'm telling you all they would already have some expectations in terms of security in mind if the customer is coming from on premises background they would say that 
my on premises setup has been very very smooth right i'm i'm not sure how much they are saying the truth but that's what they will say that on premises environment has been uh, zero uh, issues issue free no hacking incidences have been uh, encountered as yet from last 15 years 20 years or 5 years <laughs> what was the uh, timeline for the organization setup being done but they will say a lot of good things about their existing environment especially once it comes to azure or uh, i would say uh, microsoft environment the simple thing that says we implement a zero trust environment now what is the meaning of zero trust zero trust primarily would mean we don't allow any user unverified unauthorized within the environment so whenever you want to use any resources please make sure you provide in your credentials after verifying your credentials only then we'll decide whether you are able to access that resource or you'll be blocked access right that's what is the core principle behind zero trust and how that that gets done there are number of things which will be working behind the scene to ensure that everything is being captured before you are given access to that resource that is module number 1 and an architect as an architect this is what we have to achieve whether you apply multi factor authentication you apply number of other tools that you have from azure active directory premium moving on to module number 2 now this is something which is uh, i'm i'm not sure why they are including cloud adoption framework here and well architected framework the reason i am saying why i am asking that question as why because cloud adoption framework is a pretty vast as a uh, as a framework which includes everything starting from the client communication on day 1 doing the requirement gathering doing the homework understanding the domain of the customer understanding migration options migration challenges governance security so all these aspects are part of cloud adoption framework just give me a moment i'm not sure how many of you all will be able to make sense of what i'm saying so that's the reason why i want you all to go to azure documentation within azure documentation here you all will see prepare your org with cloud adoption framework let me share this link on the chat window so while i'm talking about it i don't want to go into much details right now to begin with but if you just read on the points being mentioned or the broad level overview of what caf is all about you'll understand what i'm trying to say So it says, getting started, accelerating migration, delivering operational excellence. What is the strategy? Business outcome, financial considerations. How is an organization going to plan about it? Readiness, creating a landing zone, migration, innovation. Right. So out of these steps that you will see, there are only uh, two aspects to be more precise. That is security. and governance these are only two entities which will map even if you want to just pull, <laughs> pull in this uh, section which is management creating a baseline for security and governance you can take three of them but this is a much bigger framework than what is being covered in cyber security architecture but one thing which i can guarantee you that you cannot uh, 
implement security you cannot implement governance smoothly without having the prior knowledge or inputs which are coming from the previous steps okay so even if you have to migrate what option to choose if you are going for technical and financial considerations some of the elements over here would be dependent on what kind of security option the customer is opting for so there will be dependencies that will be over here once it comes to your decisions that you are making from an organization point of view right so these will provide you necessary guidelines so that you can have your business resilience asset protection encryption of the data which is passed bit, uh, across organizations right so you'll have details being mentioned over here apart from this you also have appropriate assessments being done crowd adoption strategy evaluator right app and data readiness then you have assessments for security as well so cloud adoption framework is a much bigger and they have lot of lot of details over here within this environment okay but yes it will definitely make sense for us to begin with as an architect especially looking at security solutions governance solutions next thing that they have mentioned is well formedness architecture and for that i'll share another url right so here if you see building great solutions with microsoft azure well architected framework i don't want to get into too much details right now yeah so if you look at the pillars similar to cloud adoption framework there are number of pillars over here for well architected framework so one of the pillars is or if you look at the pillars cost optimization operation excellence performance efficiency reliability and one of the pillars is security so this is the pillar which will be the focus area over here so defense in depth identity management infrastructure protection right application security so this is one of the core sections that you have especially for security perspective so even when we are discussing so again coming back to the core point why did i take you through these members so that when you are reading this uh, when you are preparing for your exam you should not get lost just preparing or looking at all the aspects of caf looking at all the aspects of well formedness architecture right you should have a know how of that good to know that but your focus should be governance and security molik has a very important point this is like a ea job ea basically refers to a enterprise architect uh, molik i would slightly disagree with you on this point because enterprise architect has to work across domains or create a framework across domains here we are not looking at framework across domains and again these solutions are technology centric so this will be more between a solution architect and a technical architect rather than a ea job or even if you're looking from a ea perspective it is only one aspect yes it's only one aspect of ea which is from a security standpoint so i will agree with you on that on that area so anything and everything regarding security throughout your environment you will have to look at it and you have to provide a solution for that
So guys, I have already shared two key resources with you all. One for CAF, Cloud Adoption Framework. And second thing which I have shared with you is Well Architected Framework. So you all can go through both these members while you are preparing for your exam. Let's go to the next member over here, which is module number three. Designing a solution that aligns with cyber security reference architecture. Now, this is a pretty vast as a uh, uh, architecture option. You have relevant PDFs available for it. You all can go through this member and what it actually talks about. What it actually talks about is securing every aspect within your environment. So whether it is server applications, whether it is client side applications, whether it is customer centric applications, IoT devices, anything and everything that you have within your underlying environment, all those things should be covered using cybersecurity solutions. And that's the core purpose why we have this module number three which talks about security benchmark and which talks about the reference architecture. So if time permits, I will show you what this security architecture is all about and what is this diagram. Just give me a moment. Let me see if I have this PDF available with me here. No, it's not directly available over here. But if you bing it, you'll find a large PDF document focusing about cyber security reference architecture. If you look at module number four, this is about the resiliency strategy. Right? And like I said earlier, some of these things will be from specific certification topics as well, which is being covered over there. So if you have done that and you are coming here, it will become much more easier for you. And this is uh, more in terms of architecting these things rather than getting into implementational aspects over here. I'm not saying you don't have labs, but if you see the actual paper execution, there are a set of case studies being given over here. So as part of our execution, when, when we are doing the sessions, we make sure everybody goes, uh, everybody does these case studies and submits relevant solution for it. Right, so that's our primary focus over here. If you look at module number five, this is about regulatory compliance, compliance.microsoft.com. If you look at module number six, this is about Azure Active Directory, which is identity and access management. Now here, when we are looking at module number six, this talks more about, uh, this talks more about when to use what type of options. So what they would do is they will give you a scenario and within a given scenario, are you going to use a, a P1 license, P2 license, or are you going, to, going to use a free license? If you're looking at multi-factor authentication, is multi-factor authentication, or uh, they will give you a scenario saying that we are trying to solve this problem using a multi-factor authentication, right? So which will be the bare minimum license required for it? Can I do it with free license? Should I use premium P1 license? Should I use premium P2 license? And we'll have to select the right kind of options for it. So people who have already given Microsoft certification papers, they would know what I'm talking about. So they will give you a case scenario and based on that case scenario, they will give you steps. So which of the steps are relevant and that will solve the given problem by the customer. If you look at module number seven, this is about securing privileged access. Now, this is a very, very important point, guys. And if uh, you'll have already worked with Azure Active Directory, y'all would know what I'm referring over here. Now, once it comes to privileged access, there are organizations which don't have enough amount of resources on board it. They don't have people specialized from security background. So what they do is they hire consultants or they would 
work with internal team members, give them appropriate permissions, and ask them to perform certain set of tasks and activities. Right? And while they are using these, performing these tasks and activities, they would be given additional privileges. They will be given additional um, options so that they promote themselves from a normal user into a global administrator or security administrator for one or two days or till that job is being completed. That's what is called as privileged access. Okay. And this has to be a pretty uh, minutely managed and it should be thoroughly handled over here. If there is any mistakes, any challenges being done, that can result in chaos. So keeping a track or having a auditing options, have things being done correctly or not, right? Have right set of options being chosen over here or not. So these things have to be managed carefully. And that's why it is called as privileged access. Now this privileged access should be given only during a specific period of time. And once the job is being done, it has to be removed. Now, one thing which I mentioned right now was in context of privileged access management. Apart from that, there will be a lot of other uh, options or other details that you have. There are a lot of other details as well, which one needs to consider from a security operations point of view, right? Now, what are these security operations? So one set of operation, like I said, is uh, giving permissions to other users, giving permissions to external consultants or internal team members for a due course of time. That would be part of security operation, but that, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of it. Creation of users, assigning them licenses, removing licenses, changing passwords, Right? There will be enormous number of such actions and activities that a security team member has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, So all this is part of the security operations. Protecting a device, creating a new group, assigning policies to that group, all this is part of the security operation. Right? So what would be the what would be such operations that you would recommend for a given scenario? That would be part of your module number eight. As part of module number nine, as the name suggests, this is specialized into Microsoft 365. So uh, one thing which I mentioned earlier, I, and I'll reiterate myself, once it comes to your uh, security solutions, right? these security solutions will span across two environments. One is your Azure environment, and second is your Office 365 environment. So uh, one need not have a deep dive knowledge on both of it, but you need to have sufficiently good knowledge on Microsoft Azure because you are securing databases, virtual machines, networks. So you need to know those resources. Similarly, once it comes to Microsoft 365, there also you need to have a decent knowledge on that platform. If you look at module number, 10 and uh, module number 10 specifically, when we are looking at third party applications, that's that's where things will become tricky. See, when they are internal applications, you have more control over it. Along with that, if you have standardized application, that is still okay. But if there are non standardized applications, third party applications, where you don't have a prior knowledge of what are the interfaces, what are the options for security over there. That will become a area of worry. Okay, so we'll have to be careful with that. Now, once it comes to these uh, security solutions, security solutions will be applied on all three types of services, like securing virtual machines, securing pre-existing services that we have and SaaS solutions also. And when I say SaaS, we are already referring to 
we we are not just referring to microsoft 365 but what are the what about other third party solutions right third party saas solutions which you, which are getting integrated or used within the ivan how about securing them so you already have something called as cloud application security right so how do we apply those features over here module number 13 14 and 15 now this is getting more specific in terms of azure so if you look at the key resources over here so here it is talking about your on premises environment your multi cloud environments so especially if you look at microsoft sentinel if you look at arc based resources over here right so they are the ones who are focusing on hybrid environment if you look at uh, network security this is again an overlap between az500 az700 az104 so you'll see firewall solutions over here so how to use azure firewall as a solution to integrate with the existing resource that we have within azure platform so these are around 15 modules that you have and like i said this will be also with case studies there could be individuals who are expecting that um, can we have more hands on over here so my request here is it does not have too much of hands on because as an uh, as a trainer if i'm getting people for uh, cyber security architect batch i'm expecting that they already have done some of these preparations they have done the implementation within sc 200 sc 100 sc 400 if people have done any of these papers they would have experience about office 365 they would have experience about azure as well okay very good question so what all training would help sc100 so one obvious is sc100 itself doing a uh, preparation or learning all the modules of sc100 that's one as a prerequisite chetan if i tell you prerequisite i would say please go through sc300 because there are plenty of aspects from azure active directory along with this microsoft sentinel so anything that you get on microsoft sentinel please go through that as well because these would be two important aspects which will help you with sc100 thank you very much for your questions so any other questions anybody please do put it on the chat window so whenever i go to it i will make sure i answer those questions so if you see the entire breakup of modules module number 2 that is security operations identity compliance this has the highest weightage apart from this if you look at the other uh, papers they have uh, sorry other sections they have almost equivalent weightage that is security best practices and priorities security solutions for infrastructure security solutions for application and data so they have around 25 22 to 25% like i mentioned earlier you'll have number of case studies over here you can check for microsoft learn
Okay. You'll see all of them are case studies over here. Case studies for zero trust solution, design and solution, operation solution. Let me put this in the chat window for your reference. So if you see the complete paper over here, and that's why I said many of them come to this uh, course saying that since this is an architect course, all the basic implementations will also be done. I'm extremely sorry. We will not have time there to do the implementation or hands-on for each of these things. Because like I said earlier, we are expecting as a trainer, we are expecting that people already have gone through one of the previous ARB solution, which I shared earlier, ST200, 300, or 400. So here it is more in terms of discussions and case studies. And you'll be able to solve these case studies provided you'll have prior knowledge. You'll, and it's more in terms of if else or in which scenario, what to use, what is the significance of it. That's the core purpose for it. If you see the number of days as well, this is just four days session, right? So even if you look at individual papers or individual sessions, they're around three to four days. So in these four days, having an implementation being done is not possible for all of it. Some implementations, yes. Some implementations we can do, but we will not be able to do all the implementations over here. So most important is having number of case studies being done where each individual or we can uh, uh, divide team members within groups where each group can present each group can share their ideas whereas other team members can go ahead uh, put, put put across their objections put across their questions right give suggestions that this i think will be a more appropriate solution for a given environment right so this is more in terms of case studies over here So there are certain basic labs available in uh, relevant learning path. And especially for areas like Sentinel, which I mentioned earlier, improving security posture, workload protection. For hands-on activities, we will need to have both the environments available. One is Azure subscription. And along with that, we need to have Microsoft 365 E5 subscription. Because if you look at advanced features like uh, insider risk management, correct? Some of those features are available only with E5 license right now. Now, one of the important ways of how we can simplify this implementation, and based on my prior experience, I can tell you it is recommended to go for. LODS labs on demand where you have the Azure subscription where you also have the Office 365 environment. Both of them map to a same account. So that becomes much more easier for us to implement things and uh, see a free, a free flow across both the environments. That is your Office 360, Microsoft 365 environment and your Azure environment. So that makes things simpler for us. So with this, I complete the overview of what this uh, entire paper is all about. What are the options available here? This was just scratching the surface, trying to understand what are the available options that we have within SC100. What I would also want to do in today's session is, I would want to go ahead with the first module over here. What are the key resources and how do how one can work with these members? OK, and I will be sharing set of online links available and also share my experience of how do individuals go ahead with zero trust solution and as an architect, what all should be the best practices that one should ensure within the environment? Okay. So 
So before we do that, and before we get onto the first module over here, go into more details of this. I would recommend all of you all to take a quick break, grab a cup of tea or coffee, because this will going to be a slightly uh, discussion oriented session where I would want everybody to contribute, right? And after completing this module, I would also want to take up a case study over here, right? So once we are through with this module number one, and if we have covered sufficient ground, we can directly go ahead with the case study, or I would go with the second module, and then we'll take up the case study. Whichever way, right now, I would recommend you all to take a quick break, grab a cup of tea or coffee. So once we have, once we assemble back, you all will be more energized, and you all will be able to put up more questions on the chat. <laughs> right now, I see a less number of them. Okay. So let's take a break of 10 minutes over here. So everyone, grab a cup of tea or coffee. Let's assemble back in 10 minutes.
welcome back everyone i hope by now everybody has re redeemed the badge chaitali can i proceed ahead yes sir you can go ahead thank you okay no issues so guys let's proceed ahead let's go to the first module of sc100 i have already briefed you about the uh, before the brief i have briefed you about what are the arb papers which are available as part of security and compliance series i have briefed you about sc100 what are the key modules over here what gets covered what are the areas of focus within sc100 as part of today's session let's go into let's explore some of the options over here now if you look at the first learning path resource that is designing solutions that align with security best practices and priorities now one thing which i don't understand at times is once it comes to security there has to be a very clear cut guidance about how uh, how an organization is going to secure resources that should be easily released to everybody in the team and they should be able to abide by it but it is not that simple the reason being once it comes to any given organization there will always have to be a balance between security and accessibility right one of the most secure resource would not be accessible to anybody so so what is the meaning of security so security primarily means that people should be able to access depend access the resources based on their permissions based on their authorization rights and they should be able to seamlessly perform their tasks and activities which is part of the role that they, they had been given within the organization right and that's why these security best practices would make sense over here second thing that you will see is specifying a priority so that there would be say 1000 things to be done and i'll tell you my experience when we go to the customer side and say boss we are from security team we are security consultants i want you to i want to help your organization to secure all the resources that you have so can you tell me which resources you want me to secure and which of them you want it to be accessible to everybody so the simple answer would be obrakash oh, i would i would want to secure anything and everything which i have within my environment so where do i start with what is your top priority can you please list them down saying that this is this application is highest priority priority number 1 priority number 2 can you list down that no no there is no such priority everything should be secure from day one <laughs> but it doesn't happen that way we will have to go step by step we will have to perform these things step by step right and even if we, if they look at their existing on premises environment they did not make it secure from day one they did some of the initial setups right they had certain challenges certain breakings service unavailability at times and after taking number of lessons from it then finally they came to a conclusion saying that okay this is a stable security architecture that we have and this is how my resources would work but once it comes to cloud i don't know why and what goes to their mind saying that everything is magic on cloud so just <laughs> snap of a finger and things are done right so getting that clarity with team members getting that clarity with the customers and helping them with prioritization would become a key aspect let's go to the first module over here which is introduction to zero trust and the best practices framework
if you look at some of the best practices versus anti patterns right now when you say best practices this is more like a design pattern and once it comes to a design pattern it very clearly says that a design pattern is a well established solution in a given context so at times what would happen is if the scenario is very very simple and you apply a design pattern or you apply a best practice many a times what would happen is the resources and the efforts that we are putting in would get wasted so once it comes to your best practices there has to be a exact set of instructions what needs to be done why are we doing it how it should be done and most important who should be doing it what is a set of uh, privileges or permissions the individual or the group should have to perform those actions right and like i said earlier while that individual is working on that or while a group is working they should have permissions uh, they should have elevated permissions privileged permissions only for that point in time so once their job is being done that resource that uh, permission should be removed opposite of a uh, design pattern is an anti pattern right so what is an anti pattern anti pattern basically is what is the common mistakes that people do right and one of the common mistakes that i have seen happening in past is once an individual is being assigned certain role or permission that permission or that uh, elevated rights are never being removed that is kept as it is right and uh, one day whenever there there some mishap happened something which has got accidentally deleted then it uh, uh, they realize that this is something which was essential and it has accidentally got deleted so this is important to make sure that you have a best practice at the same time we should also be aware how to uh, minimize the negative outcomes or make it zero if possible now while we are working with these resources what is the role of an architect because applying the best practice or giving set of guidance and getting things done all these things are taken care by the managers what is the role of an architect over here right so this is a very very important diagram guys if we pay some attention over here this will really be helpful on our in our day to day work and it will help us realize what is the role that we are currently playing and how things will pan out once you become an architect so first thing to to, to see over here from the initial member is understanding the business strategy and that's why i think molik was mentioning that this is more in terms of ea role right enterprise architect role and the point why he was mentioning that is because some part of architect security architect's role also involves working with the business team understanding the business strategy and if i go back to caf once again the first step that you see or initial stages that you see of caf is about interacting with the business teams as part of once we understand the business strategy what they are looking for how things should work right the next aspect over here would be working with a technical leadership team and ensuring or translating the business strategy saying that this is what customer wants or this is what the uh, team is expecting which of these aspects or which of these entities can be translated into a security strategy what are the risks that we have for it and like i said whenever you are trying to maintain a balance between accessibility and security there has to be certain uh, certain points that has to be considered right so we cannot uh, have three levels of authentication for our partners or we cannot have three to four level of authentication for our end users they will not want to continue with our services right because they will find it more and more difficult to get within the system so now you have to decide whether to apply security or not apply security 
And the fact of the matter is, if there are multiple security levels and more complicated security, CAPTCHA code uh, and uh, uh, random numbers and this and that, there, there are chances that customer might not want to continue with your website. Then what to do? So that kind of decisions have to be taken with technical leadership, the technical leadership team. So what is the security strategies, policies, and standards that we're going to implement? Now, some of these security standards or some of these policies, is uh, some of them are within the control of the organization, and some of them are not within the control of the organization. Say, for example, if you are going for a banking organization, right? Today, there are certain set of norms for every banking institution, right? So even if there are, say, three to four levels, or if there is multi-fact authentication, having a, a secure icon for the, or for the user, having virtual keyboard options, even if I don't, even if I like it or not like it, even if my customer likes it or not likes it, I can't help it because that's part of the RBI guideline. That's part of the uh, geographical guidelines, which is being, which has to be implemented. I don't have an option there. And in these scenarios, even customers will abide by it <laughs> because as a customer, they would be working, they would have accounts in other banks as well. And they would have use the option of online banking. So they know that this is something which is a standard practice. Practice, Unless a bank does that, they will not be compliant. So they will not crib about it. But if you add something on top of it, they might have a challenge there. Now, once it comes to your security architect as a role, if you see the key members over here, Right? The key role of security architect will be understanding the business strategy, talking to a technical leadership team, and help to provide a bridge or translation between business and the technology teams. So whatever the whatever is the expectations of the business team, business strategy team, how can that be implemented, especially from a security point of view? So what would be the security architectural practices that needs to be implemented and how we can use Azure policies or how we can use other security baselines which can help us implement these things, right? So this has to be in coordination with the technical leadership team and the technical managers. From an implementation standpoint, From an implementation standpoint, we have security practitioners over here who will play a vital role in ensuring that whatever security guidelines have been given by the security architects, they go and apply these things. So specifying that there should be five policies, 10 policies, right? From an Azure policy point of view, that needs to be created and that should solve the problem but the actual implementation will be done by the security practitioners team, right? So this is how things will pan out. Once it comes, this is things will pan out from a role of security architects and security practitioner. So right now, I saw some raise of hands earlier. Possibly you all might be working as a security practitioner currently. Slowly and steadily, as you progress within your career, you all should go ahead with security architects role. Some of you all, yes, I am sharing my screen. And I can see an icon at the bottom as stop sharing. Guys, is my screen visible to you all? Uh, yes, sir, your screen is visible. Okay, uh, my apologies. If anybody is not able to see my screen, my recommendation would be just try logging off and logging in once again. See if that helps. But my screen is visible. Thanks, Shaitali, for the confirmation. Okay. Let me proceed ahead. So I was just discussing about how the architect, what is the role of security architect, especially from a CAF perspective. 
let's go to the next very important section over here. Now, as part of best practices, the first thing that Microsoft recommends over here is zero trust. A simple English meaning over here is trust nobody and verify everybody. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't notice that. Okay, so if you look at zero trust policy, it says trust nobody, verify everybody. Right now, the core purpose over here is I'm an administrator or uh, I am a manager, I am a CEO, CTO, I don't care. If you have, uh, if, if you are a user within the organization, and if you have appropriate permissions and privileges, you will be you will be able to access those things. If not, raise a ticket. If not, talk to the admin team to add you within that group, provide you appropriate permissions, right? And then you should be able to access those resources, right? And this is something that should be standard across the board. Because in today's scenario, what happens is there are so many uh, uh, instances where there has been phishing attacks, there has been uh, people who have uh, who are who are receiving requests from from the CEO, CTO with some other email address, but them having the same name. So there has been so much of fake emails that people have been receiving. Right? You have won a lottery ticket of one crore. <laughs> Just click over here and redeem your amount. Right? So there there has been so many such instances happening around. We cannot fall prey to any of these things, right? So that's that's the primary aspect. Whenever you have any such kind of incidents, right? This happens because we are trusting that this is something which is coming from my CEO. If I receive an email from Chaitali saying that Om Prakash, uh, you have won a one crore lottery, I know Chaitali. Right? I'm I'm trusting her. So just click on that link, and that's where the entire problem begins. So we'll have to be doubly sure because something. This is not professional. She has not been sending something like this. If I have a doubt, I would first call her up. And I have received an, such and such email. The email address is not same, but it shows your name. Is it you or is it a phishing email which I have received? So, right? So that's why you'll have to be very, very careful with these things. So whenever we have zero trust, how does this journey begin? Right. So once it comes to zero trust journey, and why we are calling it, calling it as a journey? Because for every organization right now, what is happening is there's a journey from on-premises environment to cloud environment. Especially if you are going for multi-cloud solutions, you will have Azure, AWS, GCP, and all these things can be controlled by Microsoft Azure security solutions. Okay, so as I go ahead, I will showcase those details as well. As part of your zero trust policy, we have to have a complete set of initiatives with appropriate checklist, and we'll have to identify the key stakeholders over here. So who will be the, now, whenever we begin with Azure, we get a default active, Azure Active Directory instance, Right within that, the user who has started is a global admin, but that's where the things will start. The next step over here would be to create more number of users, add them into relevant groups. Right now, these users could be cloud users, or these users could be users being synchronized from on premises environment. Right, and then we need to have a complete roadmap for it from a Zero trust deployment, the key objectives over here, like I said, verify everybody. And this is not just about any single resource. It should be across products and services. If certain resources are being given anonymous access, there's no problem with it. It's, it's a good thing to do. And there will be certain websites or certain resources where you want to uh, 
where, where you want to apply those things. But that should not be a missed out entity. That should be a known decision. That yes, this part of the application, 60% of it or 30% of it will be anonymous accessible. Once users have gone through all the product categories, they have seen the catalog, right? I do. I want it to be anonymous access allowed. But the moment they go to purchasing products, once they have finalized their cart and the moment they want to purchase a product, they will have to log in. So it should be a known decision. It should be a known aspect rather than a left out entity. Third and very important aspect over here is there should be part of that architectural diagram, right? So there is a complete Microsoft reference architecture for cybersecurity. As we go ahead, we'll discuss on that. So what part of that architectural diagram are we implementing, right? And even that part, how much percentage of security resources we are implementing right now in phase one, in phase two, what we are going to implement, and then going ahead with phase three, what would be your steps for it? Right? So that's how we can, that's what is the key role of an architect. Having a step-by-step -step guidance to address or answer these questions. If you look at the next set of resources, I have mentioned two of these entities earlier. One is CAF and second is VAF. So as part of your, sorry, just give me one moment before I, Move ahead. Let me go to my Azure environment. Am I in the wrong account? So while I was referring to zero trust policy, I did mention about some of the key details over here about Azure policies. And I did mention about the initiatives as well. So if you look at your policy section, here you will find two key aspects over here. One is policies and second is initiatives. Okay. As far as initiative is concerned, initiative is collection of different policies. So you can have uh, custom initiative or you can use pre-existing initiatives. So if you look at initiatives, there are PCA, DSS initiative, right? Canada Federal Bank, ISO initiative. So one initiative will be having large set of pre-existing policies. It'll be large set of pre-existing policies over here. So the moment you decide that I want to go ahead with this initiative, it will say, please go and implement all the policies being mentioned. Now, will it uh, verify it that the point where you begin? No. As you go ahead and keep adding the resources, for every resource, there will be set of best practices, there will be set of guidelines, and we can enforce these best practices. We can enforce these guidelines by using initiatives. Like I said earlier, initiatives are collection of multiple policies. If there are only certain set of policies that you want to enforce, not a problem. We can do that as well. So under definitions, we can 
either uh, look at existing policies and assign them to specific uh, resource group or subscri or we, we can do it on subscription level or we can also do it on management group level right so there are large set of pre existing policies which are existing over here so last time i was working with this there was more than there are more than 1000 plus policies which are existing right i am not sure if they have uh, still if they are still continuing with it there are you can go and create more set of policies as you would want right so if you see some of their policies over here omp custom policy omp vm naming policy there can be large set of policies that one can create So this is how one can in, ensure or enforce best practices within our existing environment. Second thing which I spoke about while I was uh, mentioning these details, controlling multiple subscriptions. So here, if you all see, Microsoft does not mention it as Azure Security Center or Microsoft Azure Security Center. The new name given to it is Microsoft Defender for Cloud. OK, and here if you all see. I may not have AWS or GCP, AWS accounts or GCP subscriptions over here, but. While managing my. Security posture for my organization. I can go ahead and add more environments over here. I can add AWS accounts. I can add GCP subscriptions over here within my organization environment, and I can manage them by using Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Apart from this, using Microsoft Sentinel, we can go and leverage on number of existing resources. So in a simple English, if I say I have a a single pane of control through which I can control my on premises environment. I can control my AWS subscriptions, GCP, and obviously Azure as well. So, this is the kind of environment or this is the kind of simplicity which Microsoft wants to bring to focus. And anywhere, any issue that you are facing, you can uh, see those recommendations over here. And we can apply those changes from being within Azure environment, within Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Right? So from a management point of view, this will become a single point control over here. Does this make sense for everybody? Do you all think it is a good move to make? From a user's point of view or administrator's point of view. I'm not seeing any responses. What do you all feel? Would this make sense? Will be will it be helpful for the security management team? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I'm not seeing any responses right now. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks for your response. Let's proceed ahead. Thanks, Molly. Let's proceed ahead. So apart from th these are the implementation aspects. That's why I wanted to 
point it out right away. There are plenty of other aspects, which is in terms of the, the text or briefing on how it should be done, what should be done, and that is part of your CAS, right? Cloud option framework and well-formedness architecture, right? So these are two key members. And like I said, while ensuring we are able to understand the customer's requirement, get all the details from them, at the same time, you need to make sure how are you going to implement these things. So if you look at cloud adoption framework, within cloud adoption framework, make sure we understand the risk management insights. What is the cybersecurity risk? What are the entities over here? And there are some very, very important diagrams being shown over here that one can look at. So whenever we are talking about security, checking for what is the organization mission, what are the organization assets, and how we can protect them. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the protection protection resources that you have, so you'll protect the organization infrastructure, that is virtual machines that you have, networks, applications, right, data security, and then have endpoint solutions for devices as well. So it is Windows 10 device or any kind of uh, oh. client end resources that we're talking about, right? So those things, how are we going to protect? What policies we are going to enforce on those endpoints? Apart from that, identity management. So what are the what is the user permissions that we are giving? And whether that user is added or is uh, part of the current organization environment, or they have been added as a guest user. So in today's scenarios, you have options of Azure Active Directory B2B services and B2C services as well. So there could be a partner who have been added in the current environment from part of B2B, or there could be a B2C scenario as well. So where Individuals can use their um, third party IDs, right? And using that IDs, they will be able to access certain part of the application within your environment. So if you look at the business insights over here, how are we protecting the raw information, raw data information, and how we are providing the right set of insights to the decision makers, right? So this is one of the most important members that you will have as part of your cybersecurity risk. So what information we are sharing? If you look at the entire process over here, this is the most important section. So you have criminal enterprises, you have governments, right? Which you can have hacktivists, which are trying to block the resources or which are trying to send too many requests to your underlying environment. So how you can check their behavioral pattern, right? There could be different type of attackers that we have. Some of them may be just uh, installing a software and for years, you will not see any emails from them or any other uh, details from them, but they are sneaking out information they are capturing information slowly and steadily from your environment. So if nothing is happening, many of times you might see that some of the attackers, they are just trying to sneak out information. They don't want to stop anything from your side. Just, just trying to get the information, sneak out the information, and keep updating their environment. They might be wanting to sell their products or they want to uh, sell their solutions to you. Many times you might see some of the background agents which are running within your systems. So as part of your cyber security architecture, checking for risk insights, checking for business resilience, 
So how are you going to respond in case of any kind of threat that is happening? How do you ensure asset protection? So what I showed earlier was in terms of policies, what is the standards that you'd want to maintain over here? Or what would be the best practice that, that, that one would want to implement over here? So all this will be part of the security section, security component that you have within CAMS. Let's proceed ahead. So once we have understood the details over here, let's go to zero trust principle. And like I said earlier also, I repeated myself, that is verify everybody. Trust no one, verify everybody. And here, if you look at the three important principles of zero trust. So first is, I will start from the last. That's not a correct way of reading things. First thing I would recommend from a uh, security perspective is assume breach. Whenever you are receiving a request from any user XYZ, assume breach. What is the meaning of that? When I say assume breach, in sense, anybody who is trying to connect to my system is trying to uh, take out some information or capture some information which is not expected right that's what is called as assume breach so you are always in a panic mode always uh, sorry you are always in a security threat mode that anybody who's trying to connect there's a threat for me now one would say this is unnecessary in, in this would unnecessarily increase your blood pressure it's not a breach it's a normal request response but unless we assume breach we'll never have a strict security implementation, right? So as an architect, for you, the standard scenario is assume breach. So whenever you are assuming breach to minimize data loss, what are you going to do? So first thing or a first step that you'll do is segmenting access. What do I mean by that? Even if there is an attack, right? I will want to make sure that only a limited set of network resources, virtual machines, applications are exposed to that user. So I can, um, even if there is a loss, I want to minimize that data loss. That's the core purpose of segmenting access. Second important member is, even if that uh, say two or three machines have been hacked or they have been accessed in an unwanted manner, what next, right? Even if that machine is being hacked, all the information which I have on those machines should be encrypted. That could be the next step here. That is data encryption. So even if there is a attack, even if that the data is being captured, all that information should be encrypted. So if the user has got the data and he's trying to, even if the hacker has got the data, that data should be, should not be decrypted because the hacker will not have the decryption key. Decryption key belongs with me. And that is securely put inside a key vault. Right? That is step number two. When you are assuming breach. Step number three is usage analytics. So I had segmented the access. I have, I have interpreted all the information. Third is checking for usage analytics. And one of the important things which I was mentioning about, like receiving an email from Chaitali and but the email address is not the standard synetics address. It is some other third party address. So such kind of emails should be identified and should be blocked, right? Apart from that, we can do a behavioral analytics. So generally I receive emails from Shaitali only during the day of that, that is office hours, say 9.30 or 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock, right? Not beyond that. If I'm receiving an email from her at night, 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock midnight, which means there is some problem there. She is, that, that email is not coming from Chaitali. Her account has been hacked or there is some problem over there. So this is 
what a security and uh, security architect would do when we assume breach. Okay, we'll have a uh, we'll have our antennas being set. We'll have more security measures that would want to implement over here. That is what is the response to assume breach. The next entity over here I would want to go for is verify explicitly. So if you see this same point which I mentioned, we can go more deeper over here, checking for user identity, checking for location. So is it Shaitali? And is she sending this request from a standard location? That is from office address or India address, Mumbai address for that matter. If she is coming from US, UK, right? Which I know that's, that's not possible right now because of the day to day communication that we are having, right? So if she is doing that, or if that location is something different, we'll have to block these things. Okay. Checking for device health anomalies. Now, how would one verify this? So just give me a moment. Let me showcase it over here. So if I Go to Azure Active Directory. Here we have an option of verifying. Here we have an option of verifying where the where this user request is coming from. So I can go to the security section. Here, if you will see, these are set of pre-existing members that we have for conditional access, identity protection. If I go to conditional access, so here if you see, there's option of creating a policy where we can check for a condition when a user is outside the company network, when the user is in manager's group. So we can create our own custom policies over here for ensuring conditional access. Apart from this, you have something called as sign in risk policy. You have User risk policy over here. Some of these solutions are part of your Azure Active Directory Premium P2 license. So once we have got that license associated, we will be able to use these members over here. We can also add details within the named location. So these are the countries or IP locations which I want to allow or block. So those things we can configure as part of the security section. So some of these zero trust policies that I'm talking about, we can go and explicitly mention these things without a problem. And these solutions or these features are given by Azure Active Directory. Third important resource that you see is using a least privilege access. And for this, there is another member over here. There is another member over here, which is called as privileged identity management. You have Azure Active Directory, privileged identity management. And in terms of privileged identity management, what it happens is, any uh, additional privileges that you have assigned for a given user. So for a consultant or for a pre-existing member, any privileged resource that you have mentioned, it will automatically detect that. And we can specify just in time. So this permissions will be for one hour, two hour, five hours, right? So whatever timelines you want to mention here. My recommendation to all of you all, when we are when we are working with Azure Active Directory, my recommendation would be don't use portal.azure.com. Instead, you can go for ad.portal.azure.com. This is a specialized environment, specialized resource that we have, and slowly and steadily. Most of these resources, identity solutions, 
will move into intra.microsoft.com. This is still in preview as of uh, uh, for quite some time. But um, once it comes to into general release, you all will be able to see all these resources over here. Again, Microsoft Intra is one point solution, single pane of identity management across multiple cloud environments. So like I was talking about Microsoft Defender for cloud, same way from an identity point of view, Microsoft Entra will be uh, uh, identity and permissions management. Microsoft Entra will be one single pane which can help you connect to different set of resources. So I don't have an Entra account as of now. That's why it's not allowing me to access that. So identity governance, any set of services that you want to access, all these things will be available at one place. You see this privileged identity management. And here, if you all see, there are appropriate members over here. That is, what is the role that is being assigned? Eligible assignments, active assignments, expired assignments. So, what we do is we assign a role to an individual or a group saying that this is the additional permission that you that I'm giving you for two hours. And within these two hours, you should be able to complete your task that is being assigned to you, right? This is what is referred as privileged identity management. If you have not worked with it, you all can go and enable premium P2 license. And through this P2 license, you'll be able to try this out. And within this privileged access, we can, like I was talking about, you can have just in time. And this just in time can also be interlaced with approval. So once the user has received the approval, then they will, uh, then that just in time will execute. In sense, after the approval is being given, two hours after that. Okay. So this is how we can use the zero trust principles. That is, assume breach, verify explicitly, and have a least privilege access. Least privilege access in other words, if I say, I should have bare minimum rights given to the users or the group, which will help them perform their day-to-day -day activities. That's it. Don't give them additional privileges. Don't give them additional permissions. Let's go to the next section here. That is implementation of zero trust modernization initiatives. So if you look at the first element over here, that is securing identity and access. I already mentioned that. From an identity point of view, you may have cloud users. You may have users synchronized from your on-premises environment. And that's where the entire journey begins. Right? So after synchronizing these users, you have realized that there will be 20 users, 100 users, 2,000 users, 5,000 users. Now, after these identities have been synchronized, what is the access permissions that one would want to give? Now, guys, one more thing which I want to bring to your notice. When we talk about identities over here, when we talk about identities over here many a times people relate identities only from a user point of view which may not be true in all scenarios when we talk about identities these identities can also be mapped to devices 
these identities can also be mapped to applications. So identities will not always map to an individual or a human being because one human being can be using multiple devices. Each device can have different set of applications installed on it. So identity, and when we are giving permissions, we can give permission to a user. We can give permission to a specific device owned by that user. We can give permission to an application installed on a device assigned to a specific user. Right? And if you recall, just a minute back, we talked about conditional access. So within conditional access, we can verify all these things. So when you're talking about identities, it need not be a human being. Apart from this, you have one more member over here, which is called as, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this. There is something called as managed identities. Managed identity is something which is taken care by the underlying platform. And in our case, it is Microsoft Azure, which takes care of creating and handling these identities in the backend. How many of you are aware about managed identities? Can I see raise of hand? Managed identity. Heard about it or used it earlier within your applications? Yes, previous principle, that's right. So managed identity in the backend would create a service principle. Not bad. So these are sort of elements available for identities. So when I say securing identities and access, I am referring to all the four members over there, not just the end users. Absolutely right, Molly. I am totally in agreement with your point. If you see the next resource, uh, next member over here, when you are saying I assume compromise, so first is you have secured identities. We can have multi factor authentication for users. We can have limited set of access being given, and that too, just in time. Second important member is having modern security operations, having right set of permissions for them. So when these individuals will be promoted, what kind of security operations they can perform. So we'll keep a track of that. Next important entity that you see is reduce the attack surface. Now, I don't understand the meaning of this. Can anybody help me? When you say reduce the attack surface, what, what do y'all understand or what do y'all perceive when you say reduce attack surface? Anyone, any suggestions? When you say reduce attack surface. No one? Now, one example I can give. Absolutely right, Molly. Limit the exposure by multi-layered security policies. That would be one. I'll take, give another example. Yes. Oh, you are absolutely correct. Reduce the points of exposure. And just to elaborate on the point which Pawan is mentioning, I should have minimum set of servers which have public endpoints. That could be one of the good examples of how do you reduce the attack surface. More number of servers where you have public uh, IPs, right? <laughs> More trouble you are inviting for yourself. And at that point in time, I would also recommend that we don't have any machines with public IP open for different ports, right? We, we don't open port 3389 or database ports publicly. That's, that, that's a bad practice to do. Instead, what one should be doing is we should be exposing only HTTP or and that too, HTTPS as a protocol, not even HTTP. 
that would be one of the secured practices apart from this when it comes to your devices all your devices should have endpoint protection agents endpoint protection tools being installed on it all of all your devices should have latest operating system with appropriate security patches installed on it so by doing these steps what we are doing is we are reducing the attack surface we are reducing the exposure to the risks that we have if you look at the next the last point over here that is least privilege i have already discussed about it earlier so we have iot based security you can have biometric based security over here and in today's devices we have option of uh, or touch pad or uh, fingerprint scanner we have options for biometrics that is face scanner right so even with the re recent devices that we have if you use these options if you use these bring your uh, own key or hardware specific keys if we can generate that will increase the level of security that we have especially with mobiles coming into picture where these mobiles have simpler options for multi factor authentication fingerprint scan or um, by using things like authenticator app right so we are uh, leveraging on the benefits given by the devices today right so that's what we i would recommend now once that is being done right the last but not the least whenever we are capturing the information data security governance compliance we are taking care of those members as well so this is what one can do for using zero trust modernization so if you look at the other options over here this is more detailed you all can go through it at the later stage i have already discussed about these members user accounts endpoints applications from a compliance and governance point of view we can have ransomware re recovery readiness if you go to microsoft 365 security.microsoft.com you will find more information or more details over there of how one can run a uh, ransomware attack or how we how one can perform these kind of uh, testing whether how secure is my environment locally and we can verify that so without having an external attack we can check our preparedness for handling the attack uh, options over here let's go to the next section and this is very very important guys so once it comes to the zero trust conceptually it is much easier for us to understand but once you look at the way how these things will get implemented right i did mention some aspects over here but there are lot of other details so if you look at the components that will be involved for zero trust first is the identity right identity of the user whether that user has been registered or not or that device has been registered properly or not that's one second would be the endpoints what is the endpoint being mapped over here that is the mobile device or laptop the desktop or a tab which is being used and whether we have appropriate policies being mapped over here just give me a moment so if you all look at these resources it is recommended to check for relevant tools like security.microsoft.com just give me a moment let me log in with another account like i said each of these resources over here will run across azure and i have a multi factor authentication
Okay, this is security.microsoft.com. So whatever incidents or alerts that has occurred in recent past, if you want to enable advanced hunting, check for set of queries over here. So all these security details will be at a centralized place. From an endpoint perspective, there is another portal over here, which is endpoint.microsoft.com. endpoint.microsoft.com earlier this was named as intune.microsoft.com the now the new name is endpoint security and if you see this is what i was talking about so it's not only about the endpoint devices it's about uh, devices apps users that you are creating how many devices you have uh, you have applied these principles so all these things can be seen from a single place windows 10 windows 11 what machines we have registered over here what are the applications being installed whether that device is compliant or not so all this information you'll get from here So two important entities, especially from threat analytics perspective, or I would say Microsoft 365 Defender, single solution for it, and then endpoint implementation is endpoint.microsoft.com. So these would be a set of tools which can help you implement zero trust solutions. So what I showed you right now, Microsoft Entra for identity, endpoint.microsoft.com, for endpoint protection. As far as data is concerned, depending upon where your data is lying, your data could be part of SQL Server, that could be part of your on-premises environment, that could be within third-party applications. So how are you going to protect that information? Right? Then you have your respective apps, which could be a third-party app or which could be a local resource. So these aspects like data security, infrastructure, or network security, this will be more specific in terms of Azure environment. Data in terms of archiving or classifications, that would be part of your Office 365 environment as well. Now, once it comes to the core objectives of how do you simplify things, so one aspect which I was trying to showcase is there should be simplified visibility. There should be option of automation over here where we can have a single environment where we can see all these things at a single place. There should be an option of additional uh, deployment entities over here, additional protection and uh, detection of controls. If you look at the key members over here, we should be able to see all this information from an analytics point of view. So every environment that you go to, say if I go back to the Intune environment, there's option of reports over here. So if anything has been tracked or any device has not been working properly or there's some challenges over here, we have received unwanted requests some data has been leaked out. So there should be a centralized place where I can see all the reports. OK, so you have a single place where you can see all the reports. So 
So whether you're looking at cloud apps, whether you're looking at your single applications, right? All this information, there will be reports available for it. And that is what Microsoft ensures as part of your zero trust policies. As a security architect, what our role over here would be is to make sure we understand these tools. We have configured these resources appropriately so that it becomes easier for organizations to organization resources to work with it smoothly. Another important member will be from perspective of your APIs. In today's scenario, if you're looking at Azure environment or your uh, Azure functions to be more precise, these are the ones which are being accessed by different set of mobile apps across the globe. Okay, now using Angular or React from the React as an application, they will be connecting to these APIs. So we have an endpoint protection, but many a times these endpoints are not within our control. What we what we would be controlling would be the APIs. So what we can do is we can apply certain protection rules on your resources like your app service app services that that we are using to host these APIs or using Azure functions or we can go to a next level over here that is called as API management tool. So using this API management as a resource, we can protect our resources over here. Now, once it comes to your zero trust, what it is using behind the scene would be AI models, machine learning models, which keeps verifying what are, what are the incoming requests that we have, right? How many of these requests have been properly mapped to it and which are the solutions which are not mapped to it. Now, one more member that I'm pretty sure everybody has used is your DLP policies. Okay, and like I said earlier, if you are receiving some of the messages that this content cannot be, this information is sensitive in nature and cannot be shared with uh, people outside your domain, right? You're seeing that yellow strip or a tooltip message. That's actually because of the DLP policy. And this is another way of how we can block certain messages going outside the environment or inform the risk of it to your end user. So there are options when we are configuring DLP policies, whether we just want to display the message or you want to display the message and block the message from sending. Send an email to the manager of that particular employee. So there can be different set of steps that can be taken by using DLP policies, right? So these are some of the core objectives that we have for zero trust policy. Specific from an infrastructure point of view, here if you see your abnormal behavior of the workloads or checking for identity management, any human being, when they are accessing the resource, that should be a timeline for it. Even if you are doing an RDP connectivity, even for RDP connectivity, there has to be a mechanism of just-in-time access, right? And this is what one is to do over here. And if you look at the workload objectives, there is a core purpose of creating virtual networks and subnetting so that we have a restricted access. Apart from this, we can have firewalls being provisioned so that we have a right set of routing from the incoming request to the specific workload. So whenever we are implementing zero trust deployment, what are the options that one can use depending upon the incoming request or depending upon the options that we that we is available to us from a deployment point of view, from network segmentation point of view, right? Application or user standpoint. So this would be your first set of details about network policies. So we'll stop over here. 
take another break over here for 10 minutes before we go to the next module. And we'll also take a look at the case study over here. So everyone, grab a cup of tea or coffee. Once we assemble back, we'll look at the next module and we'll look at our case study. Before we take a break, anyone, any questions that you'll have? On zero trust, anybody, any questions you'll have? So I, if I'm not mistaken, you are referring to web application firewall. Am I right, Molik? Now, from my perspective, depending upon what is the kind of implementation that you would want. So if you're looking at application gateway, and uh, where you are also looking at load balancer or HTTPS kind of resources, I would recommend go for a WAF that is WAF 2.0 with application gateway. Anyways, DDoS basic, you already have. Unless you want to go for DDoS standard. So my recommendation would be for a web application HTTPS based resource, go for web application firewall 
welcome back everyone so before the break we were discussing about zero trust model and what are the options available for implementing zero trust model so the key things that we are mentioning about is when we are implementing zero trust model this has to be on the network level the infrastructure level from an endpoint perspective what protection measures one needs to implement along with this from an application standpoint what one needs to do from an identity perspective that is creation of users groups registering your devices over here what are precautionary measures that one needs to do so we will have to implement all these steps to have a right set of zero trust policy being successfully implemented let's go to the next important section over here which is designing these solutions aligning best practices and priorities and in this conversation we are going to go deep into cloud adoption framework and well architected framework we have all i have already shared some of these links with you all about what are the various stages within cloud adoption framework let's go into more details of this and like i said earlier here if you see an important entity will be looking at the security pillar for well architected framework from cloud adoption framework perspective understanding the security methodology understanding the landing zones so in the in this part of the session what we'll be discussing about is caf and waf and how do we implement these things and like i promised we'll take up the first case study as given within the um, link which i have already shared with you all so we can discuss about the given scenario and what would be the best practices that one can enforce over here so if you look at a security strategy for any of these members over here so your step number 1 would be whenever we are looking at a security strategy we will need to evaluate different set of options and the first thing to begin with is understanding the domain of the customer what are the key members that we have what are the key entities that you have within the given business scenarios what are the kind of applications what are the kind of resources that we are that they are using on day to day basis so those things we'll have to verify second important entity that we see over here is looking at the identity platform where we talked about microsoft entra how do you add number of users over here synchronize the users add uh, and uh, register devices to your azure active directory create managed identities so all these things that we are talking about is monitoring and protecting at cloud scale from a monitoring standpoint we have microsoft sentinel and again as the name suggests this is not restricted to azure environment if you see the solutions and if you see the resources that one can protect it can go multi cloud it can also work with the hybrid environment that's why the name given as microsoft sentinel if you look at the cloud adoption framework there are nine key members over here which is referred as methodologies and each methodology stage that you will see has different set of steps being mentioned okay different set of steps within each of them so what tasks or what set of activities would be performed over here now one thing which i have not uh, mentioned earlier and which i am going to go uh, deeper into over here most of these stages that you will see microsoft provides a pre existing template for it okay microsoft provides a pre existing template for it and using these templates or the documentations documentation template that you have word excel or uh, presentation different set of templates that we have these templates can be used as a 
as a reference or a starting point and we can add more and more details within this. As part of this cloud adoption framework, once we abide by the mentioned rules, guidelines, we ask relevant questions to specific stakeholders, the chances of having a wrong solution or chances of any aspect of the solution getting missed is very, very minimal, right? So this has been part of uh, best practice and, and uh, proven practice, I would say, for success of any application which gets posted on cloud platform. If you look at the nine core members over here, which I already showed you all by going to the CAF, but this is organized much better. So if you look at the stages over here or the sections over here, that is strategy. So before we proceed ahead, understand the customer's requirement, we'll have to discuss it within the team. Define the strategy over here, understand the business outcomes, business justification. Many, many a times, even at the strategy stage itself, whether to go for cloud, not to go for cloud, when to go for cloud, which workloads should take on take on cloud right now? Some of these things can be clarified, discussed, debated on the strategy level. If you look at the step number two, that is stage number two, which is planning. This is where it comes to understanding and the way how this strategy will be executed. Right? So do we have right set of people on the shop floor. And when I say right set of people, I am not referring to the consultants team or the managed services team over here. I am referring to the team available on the customer side. Do we uh, need to train them? Do we need to educate them on these resources? Brief them about what will be the technology benefits, right? Because unless and until we have their buy-in, we have their acceptance, it will become difficult for us to execute this entire thing. So as part of the planning phase, some of these resources have to be taken care. If you go to the next member over here, that is readiness, prepare the cloud environment for planned changes, right? This is where will be the next and very important step. And if you look at creation of the landing zone, creation of your network resources and other en entities, that will be part of the readiness environment. The next resource that we'll see is the, the next entity over here is migration. Now, one would say, what if there is a startup as an organization? What if they don't have anything? Now, all these stages that we are mentioning may not be relevant for each and every customer's environment. But most of the enterprises that we see they would already have a pre-existing environment. They will already have their uh, resources, their basic applications in place. Many of them may have a uh, set of rack servers, pre-existing deployments on either the hosters environment or their local environment. So they would already have these resources in place. And we need to make sure we successfully do a lift and shift we migrate these resources from on-premises to cloud. As part of migration, we would also uh, look at data migration, storage migration, that is the uh, unstructured data. If you have uh, semi-structured data, how do we migrate that? If we have virtual machines, how do we migrate those virtual machines? So all these things will be part of the migration implementation. Okay, because and based on my experience, I'm telling you all guys, whenever we go for any of these uh, cloud migrations or uh, sorry, uh, cloud discussions, we may try to pitch in for innovation. We, we, we want to pitch in for uh, what if we want to create a new application on cloud, native applications. Customers' first response would be whatever we have right now locally available, can you please help me run that on cloud? That's all what I'm looking for right now to begin with. Later, I would decide whether I want to 
innovate my application or use pass services or use SaaS. That would be a later point of discussion. Right now, I just want to do a lift and shift. This is where more than uh, 60 to 70 percent of applications would begin, especially for a startup kind of application where, where they don't have anything. And whatever you give them will be their first solution. So in those scenarios, we can go for innovate. But in general, general scenarios, I would say it's this first lift and shift, do a migrate. And then once they have uh, uh, trust on cloud, once they are used to that environment, they don't see any kind of challenges or hiccups, then they would want you to innovate. So innovation always will be the next step here. Now, even before, so if, uh, if you see security, management, governance, these are mentioned as next stages or next steps, but it, it is not as a next step. It's actually a parallel step. So while we are doing the strategy, while we are doing the planning, parallelly we'll be creating options for security. Even when we are doing migration, right? During the migration, our step one over here would be migrating the set of users. I have already mentioned about Azure AD Connect, right? So when you are doing the migration, we'll be migrating the, uh, the users, respective groups, right? From on-premises to your Azure environment. So all these things are happening parallelly, though they may be mentioned as separate blocks over here. But if you look at the flow diagram, management, uh, sorry, uh, governance, security, these things happen parallelly. Once it comes to management, like I said, users are looking at lift and shift. So they want to first verify if uh, I can uh, port these applications or move these applications. But after doing a lift and shift, after moving these applications, how does it impact the performance? Is it negatively impacting the performance? Is it positively impacting the performance? So those things will be part of the management. Now, one would say, Om Prakash, suddenly you're talking a different language altogether. We were focusing on security. I do agree to your point. But if you look at cloud adoption, cloud adoption framework, like I said earlier also, is not only about security. There are a lot of other aspects. Security is one of the members over here. So once we migrate these workloads, are people able to access or connect to that application? Are we able to ensure that people with the right set of permissions are able to access the ent entities? So these things have to be verified. And this keeps happening uh, in, in intermediary steps rather than the end. It happens intermittently. And if you see, this is what I was talking about. So secure, manage, and govern. These things are happening parallelly. So while you are defining the strategy, you will have to look for security as well. While you are planning, while you are getting the environment ready with landing zone, while you are doing the adoption using migrate, modernize, innovate, in each of these areas, we have to parallel look at governance options and security options. From a security standpoint, if you look at some of the key options that one is to work with. So if you recall in the previous uh, module, zero trust model, where we discussed about the first diagram, business alignment. So from a business alignment point of view, three important entities here. First is the risk insights. So how you are, how as a security architect, you are going to minimize the security risk. You can't make it zero, but how we can minimize that? What are the steps for minimizing it? Another important entity over here would be security integration. Now, this becomes a very, very important point, guys. Whenever you go to a customer side, they will always have a pre-existing security solutions. Right? And keeping this perspective in mind, I would want to 
share another key resource with you all, which is called as Misa. I am not sure how many of you all have heard about it or used it earlier. As far as Misa is concerned, this is called as Microsoft Intelligent Security Association. As part of Misa, what it talks about is it very clearly says that if you already have a pre existing resource, if you already have a pre existing security solution, you go, you don't have to throw it away. I can help you integrate with the pre existing security solution. My recommendation to all of you all would be if you all can take a look at it, you all can search for if you already have a security solution present on uh, present within your environment or present on the customer side you have product integrations so which are the organizations or which are the products that we have whose integration is made available for now. So you can check that. Depending upon whichever customer you are selecting, what are the products given by that customer? As for my understanding, more than 70 to 80% of mappings I have seen here. And that's what I'm saying. So y'all should go ahead and check this out, whether the third party tool or any other product that you are referring to, is it being used over here or not? Is it being mentioned over here or not? So you can verify that. You can see a complete set of products available here. Microsoft Defender for Cloud, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Applications, Microsoft Defender Office 365, Oops. Microsoft Purview, Microsoft Sentinel. There is another member coming up, which is called as Microsoft Priva for privacy management. Microsoft Purview eDiscovery, which is uh, as, a pre as part of the premium product. Microsoft Purview Audit. So Microsoft is adding more and more resources day by day. DMARC reporting for Microsoft 365, domain-based message authentication, reporting and conformance. So there are plenty of pre-existing solutions. Plus, like I showed you all, is a complete list of third-party software integration, which is possible over here. So you can take your time, explore this, because whenever you go to customers, and talk about any of these security solutions. One primary hurdle that you all might uh, come across is I already have a product and we have recently purchased a certificate for it, uh, license for it. Okay. And I'm not sure if I, if I migrate these things on Azure, whether I will be able to reuse these security solutions or not. So this would be your answer for it. As an architect, I'm telling you. Let's go to the next very important section over here, which is landing zone. So from a landing zone point of view, what are the key resources over here? So first of all, what is this landing zone? Landing zone is, uh, as, as the name suggests, this is the first step that one would take when you are building a blueprint or an architecture for deploying your resources or creating your environment on Azure platform. And the reason why I'm saying this as a blueprint is you will, you will not create anything on Azure environment. And this is generally happening on paper or you'd be using a tool like Visio or uh, uh, Paintbrush or any, any such tool 
that is uh, relevant for your organization or, or your environment. Okay. So when you're looking at a landing zone, here what we're talking about is we'll have to look at how many number of subscriptions we will require. We Do we need a separate dev test subscription? We need a separate production environment, production subscription, or we need to have a single subscription with multiple resource groups inside that. So these kind of decisions will be taken on the landing zone section. From a security point of view, governance point of view, networking, identity. Now let me ask this question to you all. From a security point of view, what do you all recommend? Should we have a single subscription or should we have a separate subscription for dev test and production? What do you all see? So Malik says, separate gives me more flexibility. Okay. Thanks for your input, Malik. Anybody else who disagrees with Malik or agrees with him and what is your reasoning for it? Y'all need not agree with him. Y'all have y'all y'all could have a different point. Pawan has a very important point. Will it cost more? Yes. Uh, will it cost more? I would say yes and no both, because if you look at cloud, cloud basically is pay as you go model. Cloud primarily is a pay as you go model. Even if you have a single subscription and you don't create those many resources, you'll not pay for it. Because you don't pay for a subscription. What you pay for is the resource being used. I agree with you, Molly. So I can have shared services. So I think, Pawan, does it answer your question? Subscription does not cost you. It is the services that will cost you. And if I go with the logic that Molly is mentioning, I can have a, if I have a different subscription for, for uh, a dev test, I can go for a dev test subscription where the cost will be lower. So it will not cost me more. <laughs> Inadvertently, it will cost me less if I go for two subscriptions. Because MSDN subscription, dev test subscription, the service cost is lower as compared to the EA subscription or a production subscription. So with two subscription, like Molik was mentioning, it gives me more flexibility, it gives me more control, plus it will also help me reduce cost. Okay, let's proceed ahead. I think everybody has got the point, though not everybody is responding. That's fine with me, but everybody is able to understand the significance of taking multiple subscription. Second important point that you see is when it comes to landing zone, here you can look at application, migration, modernization, innovation, right? Whether you want to go for combination of IS, PaaS, SaaS, all these kind of decisions, discussions will happen while you are creating a major landing zone. Apart from this, whatever points we mentioned in, in the previous discussion, that is uh, uh, creation of different set of virtual networks, Right, subnets, adding network security groups, giving appropriate permissions, right, having um, set of groups. Each group should have appropriate role-based access control. These kind of discussions, decisions are made when we are creating a landing zone. Now, once this landing zone decision has been made, then you can go ahead and provision it by using a code. Now, anybody who can help me with what is the type of code that it is referring to? Anyone, any suggestions? 
what technologies do we use for infrastructure as code thanks lord kumar thank you molik so terraform is one of the most common most commonly used resource though there are many of them you have chef you have ansible there are many of them but one of the most commonly used is terraform and second is i would i would not say arm because arm is slightly older i would say bicep bicep is a more recent one or microsoft uh, azure blueprint microsoft blueprints that you have that is even more effective right and very very rightly said these are the resources that will help you create your landing create your entire environment so if you look at types of landing zone one would be a, your platform landing zone like molly was mentioning about having centralized services right and then you have then you can have application landing zone where you can have a relevant workload being deployed that would be your application landing zone so these would be your set of resources that you have within a uh, set of resources within azure landing zone now after this discussion of landing zone again coming back to the key point we are <laughs> security architects so we will have to focus on security so from a security point of view what are the inputs that we can provide from design perspective within the landing zone so first thing that one should do is or one i would be focusing on is azure ad reporting azure active directory how many users what permissions who is accessing which resource at what point in time right i will have to take a note of that second is any new resource being created all that details would be mapped within azure activity logs right i can again azure activity logs there is a small uh, restriction over here it is available only for 90 days the content which we are pushing within uh, activity logs they will be available only for 90 days if you want to use these resources beyond 90 days we'll have to associate that within log analytics so we can take a log analytics workspace and we can map these activity logs within log analytics workspace third important resource that you will see is enabling defender for cloud now when you say defender for cloud it may not be referring to a single entity just give me a moment let me go to microsoft defender for cloud let me go for recommendations here okay i am not sure if everybody is able to see is clearly yeah so if you see the options available microsoft defender for servers app service azure sql storage key vault containers dns right microsoft defender for apis so when you talk about defender there are plenty of options available and depending upon your landing zone depending upon what resources you are going to create you will have to enable all those defenders that's what is meant now that that is what it meant but means by enable defender for cloud okay now once that is being done the next important entity over here is monitoring the patching drift now what is this patching drift all about and anybody who can help me how do you bring back this patching drift anyone any suggestions
how do you get it back to the original position? No one? Okay. See, many a times what happens is, since these environments are being monitored by Azure, since we are looking at each of these resources, and these are internally being managed by Microsoft. So here what one can do is, we can use something like Azure Automate. Okay? And through this Azure Automate, we can use your resources over here, which can bring it back to the original state by using appropriate images that you have. Right? So if I go to Power Automate as a resource, yeah. If I go to Azure Automate as a resource, within Azure Automation, you have something called as DSC, which is called as Desired State Configuration, right? And through this Desired State Configuration, what one can do is we can bring back our existing resources to the same state if we want. And that's what is called as Desired State Configuration. So if there is any additional resources being applied, right? Any uh, automated version change which have happened and we want to bring it back to the original position, we can make use of DSP, partial DSP for monitoring the patching drift. Along with this, I have already spoken about Azure policy. I have shown you all details over here from perspective of how we can apply these things through initiatives. Along with this, we can have real-time alerts with Azure Event Grid and the key options available here. From IAM perspective, that is identity and access management, we can have custom roles over here. And within that custom role, we can add policies. Why custom role? Provided if you all, if you're requirements of security role is not getting satisfied by the existing role, right? In that case, go for a custom roles or custom uh, and add permissions within that. If your requirement gets satisfied, it's very much feasible, very much easy to understand and implement that. So if I go to any of my existing resource groups or resources for that matter. Yes, let me take one of them here. That is OMP resource group. Let me go to access control IAM. So if you look at the options available here, custom role creation, doing a role assignment, right? There is a complete list of pre-existing roles that we have, okay? There's a huge set of pre-existing roles that we have. If these roles don't satisfy the requirement that we have, only in that scenario, go for a custom role. Say, for example, I want to go for a reader role, right? So whom do you want to assign this role? Will be the members of this. So we can assign it to a specific group that we have. What is the permissions that we have within the reader role? We can check that from here. You can see the complete set of permissions. So if you want to add, remove, modify, delete any of the permissions which is being given, then go for custom rules. I hope this makes sense to you all. 
this is the core purpose of role based access control once it comes to your resources here what we can do is we can align our requirements with the your platform we can work with the members over here and for a given scenario we can determine the incident response plan so best part is having the stricter rules to create and like i said if some of the standard rules don't meet the criteria create a custom resource create a custom plan over here let's go to the next important entity which is we are by now clear with the caf solution so while this security while this planning is the strategy formulation is happening planning is happening the readiness is happening as a security architect you have to make sure your elements right or the security requirements are being taken care so we have to ensure that if you look at the well architected framework this is the next important resource now one would say om prakash when when i'm using caf is there a chance that uh some of the uh, criteria is not being met or something is being missed out it's not that way right these are two different approaches that i would say from a uh, enterprise perspective look at caf and if you are getting into specific areas if you see there are five core core pillars over here reliability cost optimization operational excellence right so if you see the sequence first comes the cap where the migration and everything is being done all these things are being taken care under and keeping in mind the business objectives are aligned with it right so that part is being taken care next is well architected framework right so this is how one should see it so if uh, if you are looking at these pillars like reliability cost optimization operational excellence this is something which will which will be an iterative process which will keep happening time and again it's not a one time kind of activity but whereas if you look at caf caf is more like one time activity you will not go to a stakeholder <laughs> every day you will not create policies and initiatives every day you will not do a vm migration every day right so caf is more from a broader perspective and most of the activities are kind of one time activities well as well as well architected framework and the steps that you have defined over here this will happen on a regular basis or an iterative basis so keeping this perspective in mind and like i said out of all the pillars our focus would be only one member over here which is security <laughs> now one would say uh, om prakash how about the other pillars guys the other pillars that we have these are being addressed or these are being mapped with az305 that's where we go deep dive into various azure services and that's where we understand the components and do the architecting for initial four pillars from a security pillar point of view these are some of the core things that one should look at right now some of these things you all will feel is being repeated and this is with purpose correct so if you look at the first entity which is identity and access management this is something which we have been talk which i have been talking time and again second is threat protection where the various defender solutions will come into play third member that you will see is your cloud security right this is where we spoke about the uh, cloud apps third party saas solutions being used custom solutions being used right so some of these things we already have discussed what we have not discussed is the remaining aspects which is information protection information governance insider risk management right compliance management these these are the things which we have not discussed so i would want to take these points for discussion now like i was mentioning earlier 
security.microsoft.com. Same way, we have compliance.microsoft.com. Okay. We have compliance.microsoft.com. So if you look at compliance.microsoft.com, here you'll see options in terms of insider risk management, adaptive protection, various improvement actions, solutions, assessments, various regulations, depending upon various geographical areas. And this is more in terms of document protection. So you can create your own assessments over here, run these assessments on your environment. You all should have all the necessary documents inside this. Documents with sensitive keywords and uh, other sensitive information so that it can bring up the right set of improvement actions for you. So what one should be doing to make sure your environment is more compliant and it satisfies all the compliance criteria. Right? <laughs> Even if I don't have too many details, it, if you see this, it is giving me more than 15 to 20 security measure what I should implement within my environment, conduct a functional testing, determine auditable events, check for OWASP top 10 rules, Along with this, I can create trainable classifiers over here. We can do a exact data management over here. So when we talk about trainable classifier, the core purpose of trainable classifier is we can use machine learning or artificial intelligence based models over here. And using these artificial intelligence models, Using this artificial intelligence models, what one can do is we can verify these details, verify these guidelines that we have. Can you see this? So there are finance based filters, HR based filters, legal agreements, various profanity words that can uh, that can be that should not be used within or within an organization threat based keyword that should not be used right so there are already pre existing set of members or pre existing set of entities that we have so one can go and configure this for a given environment and if there are certain words which are not there and you want to add it on your own we can do that as well so through this compliance what we are trying to achieve is we are the we are scanning the complete environment checking for specific set of keywords or other entities that we have and making sure we classify or segregate these documents. Now, after segregation, what do you want to achieve is up to the organization. So whether you want to uh, block these documents from being shared to anybody or you want to uh, show a tooltip message, right? You want to enable any kind of endpoint DLP settings. You want to just scan and keep a track of it that how many number of times such instances have been happening in past. So all these things we can check over here. Along with this, there is another important member which is called as insider risk management. Insider risk management is primarily a very important aspect where an internal team member is trying to leak out some of the essential documents, right? Now he or she may be doing on purpose or it may be by mistake as well. So we are not trying to blame anybody, but what we are trying to do is we are trying to collect this information so that if it is happening by mistake, we can uh, organize a meeting with that uh, team member and their manager at. Was this is what what we have seen. 
<laughs> there will be somebody who is uh, uber enthusiastic trying to take some data from office going to his home his or her own home and trying to work on that which is i would not say a bad thing but taking out any data from original premises using a thumb drive or pen drive or trying to uh, send this information to a non organization id these are certain things which are security threats which are security challenges and cannot be allowed right so some of these things the the employee may be doing it with good intent but it is against the security policy so these things have to be brought to the notice to their manager especially uh, some of the cases which microsoft has mentioned in past what has happened is people who are on uh, uh, notice period they would want to, to knowingly disturb some of the customer relations or send an email to a customer saying that i am leaving this organization but i want to be in touch with you and uh, i can uh, leak and they can leak out some of the critical documents from within the organization so for such kind of employees what one can do is we can apply this inside the risk management without telling them we can start i'm not saying people will do that but still just to avoid any any such uh, mishap we can apply these things so that so that they don't delete any critical details right or whatever deletions they are making we we keep, keep a backup of that in the back end so i'm not talking about the personal information see personal information is something that belongs to that particular employee but if there is some organization information where and how do i know that i already have classifiers for it already created okay so what i want to do is i want to keep a tap on that any such critical information if it is getting deleted i want to archive it see my own purpose as a security manager is or a security architect is i don't want to lose any critical information from within my organization right so this is the next important resource and with compliance.microsoft.com we can enforce information protection information governance insider risk management right we can enforce compliance over here and we can have a mechanism of finding out if something like this is happening and responding to it right so these are some of the core elements that we have as part of that so if you look at the solutions over here from cloud adoption framework we can do a planning over here by applying zero trust principles three important entities that we mentioned earlier assume breach do a explicit verification and third important member over here is least privilege access from a vast perspective if you look at the security point of view protecting the applications and data from threat from a reliability point of view if there is a failure there is some problem because of security if there is certain data which which gets deleted how do we recover that data and make sure we have a bcdr compliant so these would be part of your strategy for security and governance so with this we complete our two important modules and as discussed i would want to take up a case study over here case study for module uh, sorry module 0 case study introduction and let's go with module 1 which is building a overall security strategy so everyone let me share this url okay so everyone go to the link which i have shared on the chat window let's go to the first one that is case study introduction everyone take 5 minutes 
go through the case study make your own notes for it make your key points specific from a security standpoint
let's proceed ahead. So I'm sure everybody's looked at the case study. So if you look at this, modern commerce company, retail destination, 50 physical stores, Sixty percent of global revenue, thirty percent of annual gross sales. Now, for such kind of customer, how do you mention, or how do you even talk about having uh, reduced attack surface? Their their business is coming by having more and more devices, especially when you're talking about mobile app. How are you going to reduce the attack surface? Reducing the attack surface would mean giving up on their business, which is not possible, right? And as an organization, every organization would want to uh, increase their revenue or increase their sale multifold. So that's why it is important that we are aligned with the customer's business requirements. So how do we make sure we help the organization achieve their revenues, revenue targets. At the same time, ensure secured communications. So this is the overall introduction of the environment. Let's go to the next member over here. That is designing a zero trust solution. So what are they looking for? Everyone, go to the zero trust section. We can look at the reference architecture over here. So what are the options? for passwordless authentication, multi-factor authentication, so one needs to build a solution. Now, one of the bad ways of doing things over here would be, one can say, go ahead, use Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory will have all these options. That's not the right approach. The right approach over here would be getting into specifics of Azure Active Directory or getting into specifics of certain set of resources and then showcasing what will be the relevant options over here. So you can check for Microsoft MCRA, which is Cyber Security Reference Architecture. They are already pre-built entities that we have over here for zero trust, multi-cloud and cross-platform. We can download the file from here. Share the link with you all. So you can download the Reference architecture here. So 
the same file that I have. Already downloaded. So what are the options you're going to use? So if you look at the options available, threat intelligence, capability integration, end-to-end -end integration, beyond the VPN user access, so based on the case study being given, which are the relevant members over here that we can implement. So what would be the security roles and responsibilities that you will plan, that you will plan for the end users, the security architects or security team members within Tailwind traders? So you have to be more specific over here. This is the security reference architecture. Let me run this. So which of these members will be part of your solution architecture? So what would be the significance of identity and access management? See, when you talk about reference architecture, doesn't mean everything out of this has to apply. Not necessary. Say, for example, in the current case, I don't see a strong case for information protection. I can ignore this. I see a strong case for Azure Active Directory, where I have, I should use options for hello for business, authenticator app. I should use privileged identity management, specifically uh, B2C, B2B will be there, but more prominently B2C, because we are talking about a lot of consumers who will be logging in using their own credentials and they will be connecting to the application here. Right? So from this reference architecture, we should be able to identify which of these members are best fit for my solution. And focus on that. In this scenario, I don't see too much of relevance in terms of hybrid infrastructure because they don't have strong on-premises kind of environment. If they have, we will have to ask them to migrate some of these things to Azure so that we can have a centralized place to manage these resources. So some of these things you all can mention as suggestions that this is what I would want to provide as a solution for this advantage. Okay, so everyone, you all can download the reference architecture. Some of the resources like Cross cloud and cross platform is not making sense in the current case study, in the, in the first case study that we are referring to. Maybe upcoming options or the other resource that you have, there it might make sense. So you have to be very, very careful. Go through the case study which is being given to you as part of your exam. Understand that and provide the right set of suggestions for it. So we'll stop with this for today. Thank you very much, everyone. We still have five minutes. So in case you all have any questions, doubts, queries, please put it on the chat window. Everyone, please fill in the feedback form.
Chaitali has already shared the feedback form with you all. Chaitali, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Uh, guys, it's a request to you all. Make sure you submit the feedback form before leaving the webinar. Also, if you have any doubt or question related to the topic which has been covered in this webinar, you can ask it. I repeat, I have shared the feedback form link in the chat box, so make sure you submit the feedback form. Thank you. Uh, guys, please note the recording will be available to you all on our official YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. The link has been shared with you all on your uh, like chat box. Also, it's a request to share your feedback on the feedback form. The feedback form link has been shared with you all in the chat box.
uh, i hope you all have submitted the feedback form by now so we will wind up now thank you all for joining the webinar thanks a lot